I'm back with Stephen Meyer, the director for the Center of Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, uh, author of Return of the God Hypothesis. Uh, Stephen, we've been talking about uh, two lines of evidence, the uh, idea that the universe had a beginning, uh, positing that um, an immaterial force might have created it, also the idea of a fine-tuned universe uh, pointing to a, a fine-tuner. Let's turn to the third line of evidence, and here I want to introduce the atheist Richard Dawkins, who once made the statement that it was Darwin, he says, who made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And I think what um, Dawkins was getting at, and this comes right out of his, uh, his book on the blind watchmaker, he basically says that the argument from design to a designer has been invalidated by Darwin. Why? Because we can now explain the appearance of design, the fact that, that human beings appear to be and other beings appear to be functionally adapted to the environment. We can explain this by natural selection, by survival of the fittest, by the various ingredients of what can be called Darwinian evolution. But your argument ingeniously takes off from a point that is almost, you can say, prior to evolution. So try to, try to lay out the argument you're making and how it is in no way not only refuted, but not even challenged by evolution. Right. Uh, even before you can get an evolutionary process going, you have to have life. And the origin of the first life turns out to be a scientific mystery from a materialistic evolutionary standpoint that is now universally acknowledged. Even people, especially people working on the question of abiogenesis called origin of life researchers. And this is what my PhD was uh, uh, addressed in, in Cambridge was origin of life biology. People working in the field acknowledged that we're nowhere close to explaining the origin of life materialistically. And that we're, and uh, I mean, my own supervisor told me that uh, coming back from an origin of life conference, we're at a complete impasse. She said, our field is becoming dominated by quacks and cranks. Everyone knows that everyone else's theory isn't working, but they're not willing to admit it about their own. And, but the, and there's, a, there's really a more fundamental reason for that. And that is that the big discoveries of modern molecular biology have shown that what we once thought of as the simple cell is not simple at all. It's a complex information storage, transmission and processing system, or rather it contains one. It's chock full of mi miniature uh, technology, miniature nanomachines, little mini miniature um, molecular machines in a form of informational nanotechnology. And, and the attempt to explain these systems by reference to undirected material processes has utterly failed. And instead, each of these things that I just mentioned, in particular, the digital code stored in the DNA, uh, uh, reveal, I think, the activity of a mind. They're the kinds of things that we know only minds produce. So I think there's a positive case for intelligent design to be made about the discoveries of modern mo molecular biology, not just a critique of these evolutionary ideas. Let's come back to the digital code or the computer code that is um, inside of the cell and, and, and it makes up its DNA. Um, is it a fact or, or is it not a fact that when Darwin was talking about evolution, he was talking about how one life form can transition into another. In no way did Darwin even <clears throat> attempt to explain how did we get life in the first place, right? Yes, Darwin exactly. is talking about how you go from life form A to life form B to life form C, but what you're focusing on is you're saying, listen, all of life has something in common, and that's DNA. And as we burrow our way into the cell, we discover inside of it, not just a complex machinery, but a complex code. Uh, and the code is an information code, and the information code suggests some form of a directing intelligence, because who put it there? Where'd we get the code? Right, right. right. This is, well, this is the great discovery that Darwin knew nothing about. Um, 1953, Watson and Crick elucidate the structure of DNA. Five years later, Crick formulates something called the sequence hypothesis in which he posits that the chemical subunits that run along the interior of the, the twisting double helix molecule, they're called nucleotide bases. He said that these bases are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language, or like the zeros and ones, the digital characters that we use in software today, which is to say it's not the physical or chemical properties of these 
uh, chemical elements that give the, the DNA its function, but rather their arrangement in accord with an independent symbol convention that was later discovered and is now known as the genetic code. So we have a genetic text translated by a genetic code, and that's what's going on inside the cell. What we know from exp experience is that information, especially in an alphabetic or digital form, always comes from an intelligent source. Bill Gates has said that DNA is like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever created. We know that software comes from programmers. We know that information in a book or a radio signal or a hier hieroglyphic inscription similarly always comes from a mind, not an undirected material process. So I argue in my first book, Signature in the Cell, and in this uh, uh, more recent book, that the, the digital information present at the foundation of life provides a powerful indicator of the activity of a designing mind in the origin of life. I mean, it's so telling to me that Francis Crick, who was, of course, a, he was a kind of dyed-in-the-wool atheist when he recognized that from the very beginning in the simplest form of life, you had to have this highly complex organization he actually said, well, listen, there's no way. He, he knew that there would be no way this could somehow just spring into existence on the earth. So he said that intelligent aliens from out of space must have shown up and seeded this kind of life on earth. I mean, you can see the extent to which these guys have to engage in science fiction fantasy in order to try to explain something and avoid having to use, well, let's just call it the G word. Yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's the analog to the multiverse uh, hypothesis in the other uh, other subject area we were just discussing. Discussing scientific atheism is getting kind of weird. Uh, we're positing multiverses and simulation hypotheses, whether we all exist in the mind of a computer programmer idea or alien designers, the panspermia idea. Even Richard Dawkins has floated that idea in an interview with Ben Stein in a film several years ago. And Dawkins this summer said he was knocked sideways with wonder at the complexity of the informational data processing system inside the cell. He acknowledges that it's the, the machine code of the genes, he says, is uncannily computer-like. Well, hello, that's not just the appearance of design. That's that's evidence of actual design. And it is so because of what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning. This is how Darwin reasoned in The Origin of Species. The present is the key to the past. What we know in the present is that it takes a mind to generate information, especially in a digital or alphabetic form. So the discovery of information in even the simplest living cells points to the activity of a designing mind. That's what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. It's not an argument from ignorance or a God of the gaps argument. This is a scientific argument based on, again, our uniform and repeated experience of what it takes to generate information. We know of no other cause that creates coding systems or digital code. And isn't it also a fact, Stephen, that let's just say, let's just go with the Crick idea and say, let's say that intelligent aliens from outer space came and deposited this complex machinery on Earth. Well, where'd the aliens come from? Where'd they right, get right. their creative intelligence? Who put it there? So in other words, it just kicks the question again off away from Earth to Mars or some other planet, uh, but in no way does it explain the origin of intelligence, does it? It doesn't explain the origin of the information that would be necessary to get the evolutionary process going on that planet, which would have ultimately resulted in an intelligent alien. And the other thing it doesn't explain, Dinesh, is what we were talking about in the last segment, the fine tuning of the universe, which much of which was set from the very beginning of the universe. So no being within the cosmos that arises long after the beginning could explain the origin of the fine tuning present from the beginning of the universe, nor could such a, the, an alien designer hypothesis explain the origin of the universe itself, the Big Bang. So again, it, what I argue in the book is that theism provides a better, more comprehensive explanation because it accounts for the three key evidences that we're looking at, whereas maybe panspermia, the, the space alien designer, can account for biological design on Earth, but it doesn't account for fine tuning or the origin of the universe. Similarly, deism might account for the origin of the universe and the fine tuning of the universe, but it doesn't account for the evidence of design that arises long after the beginning because a deistic creator doesn't act except at the beginning of the universe. And materialism doesn't explain any of these three things. And yet that's the dominant worldview still held by many prominent spokespersons for science. I think that's changing. And that's why I call it the return of the God hypothesis. Wow. Thank you, Stephen Meyer, for a really stimulating conversation. I really appreciate it. You too, Dinesh. Great, great questions and good discussion.